The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and read from the prophet Isaiah. The eyes of all were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? Jesus said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove Jesus out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But Jesus passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today's gospel is a bit of a curiosity because uh, haven't we heard at least part of this before? And do we have? We're back in the synagogue in Nazareth. We've rewound the tape, so to speak, to something we've heard. And then we go on. We've gone back because last week we were focused on Jesus' message. This week we're looking at the reaction. And it's not a good one. Now, we don't have a transcript of the conversation. We've just a fragment. There are some quotes that the evangelist Luke has preserved for us. We kind of have to fill in all the gaps as to what gave rise to the things Jesus said. So there are clues in these things that he says as to why what starts out as a genial discussion of Scripture ends up in murderous rage against our Lord. And we should investigate this. We should try to understand this because rage is something we see around us an awful lot these days, these past couple of years, the outbursts of violent rage, of desire to harm others with whom we have disagreement. You know, what is setting people off? Why does it happen in our supposedly modern, enlightened society? Now, you know, anger is an understandable reaction to insult, to injury, to threat, both in its physical and psychological senses. You know, anger provides us with sort of an emergency boost of energy to our mental and physical defenses. Threaten us physically and, and the anger that is aroused accesses energy to fend off attack. You know, lie to us or insult us. And anger sparks a, a quick assessment of the threat that is posed. However, you know, we can also become angry if someone resists our aggression. You know, how dare they defy us? Confront us with uncomfortable truths, and we grow angry at the embarrassment of being deceived, or the scandal at having knowingly gone along with a lie. We grow angry at the loss of face, which is also a threat as we are diminished in the eyes of others, in our own eyes. And rage is something even more than that. It is anger out of control. It is anger wed to panic. And it can lead to frantic violence and other kinds of overreaction that can damage relationships, damage them sometimes beyond all repair. It is a tantrum. Disturbing enough in a child, frightening when adults act this way, whether in verbal or physical assault. So, 
I ask, what happened at the synagogue in Nazareth? Now, if you remember last week, I told you Jesus, he proclaims the Jubilee. And as I explained last week, the Jubilee, well, it's a wonderful thing. It's this provision of the law of Moses for a reset of Israelite society. You know, those sold into slavery for debt are to be freed. You know, debts generally are to be forgiven and so on. Now, I did know that likely Jesus came off as a little presumptuous. You know, he's proclaiming the Jubilee. You know, the question arises, you know, who is he to do that? Well, we know, but his audience doesn't. I also spoke of the deeper meaning of this episode. Jesus not only proclaims the Jubilee, but he asserts that he is the Jubilee. Through him, the captives are set free, and so on. In him, the great reset is made possible. This is a wonderful message. What happened? Now, to set the scene a little more precisely, we need to understand how the synagogue functioned. Now, most think of synagogues today as like being like our churches. You know, they are places of worship. Well, in Jesus' day, that would not have been their principal function. Yes, scripture was read there and people did pray there. But it was the temple where worship as ancient people would understand it happened. Sacrificial offering is what makes for worship. Synagogues were what you might call a lay institution, as distinct from the temple, which would be a priestly institution. So synagogues were places of study and discussion, places of conversation and investigation of questions. Now, in my student days, I had a summer internship in Montreal, where you probably know there's a very large Jewish community. And one of the Hasidic Orthodox uh, synagogues held an open house. It was uh, fairly a fairly an important anniversary. So they were opening up to the community to go, like, come and see. And I went. Now, a synagogue service is very similar to the first half of Mass. There is prayer, the reading of scripture, and then the rabbi delivers a sermon. He speaks at considerably longer length than I do in a homily. And then usually they go to lunch. Now, at this synagogue, being Hasidic, Orthodox and very traditional, uh, what happened immediately afterward, instead of going to lunch, at the time then we would begin to celebrate the Eucharist, the men adjourned to the hall and they were carrying books and they had note paper and they broke all that out to begin an intense discussion of the scriptures. And there they were, the whole conversation facilitated by the rabbi. And I think that is the better picture to have in our minds when we're thinking about what's happening uh, with Jesus when he sits down, declares that the scripture has been fulfilled. And then he sort of skips over the sermon and opens the floor for discussion, as it were. And those present, they begin to, well, ask questions. Intrigued as they are by him, they begin to discuss. Be more like if right after the homily, we did a big Bible study right now. So we know from Luke that at the outset, people were, quote, amazed at his gracious words. Jesus was doing well, talking about the Jubilee and probably relating it to his great theme of the kingdom of God. But at some point, the conversation had to address, well, how exactly is this jubilee brought about? You know, the question in a Christian framing is, how do we enter the kingdom of God? Now, most of us here as baptized Christians know, know the answer. Jesus teaches us that it is not going to be easy for us. It is the narrow gate that we have to go through, the eye of the needle. Our lives need to change. Assumptions need to be challenged and attachments let go of. There must be an end to hypocrisy and a consistency between what we claim to believe and how we live as people who confess that God is love. Or else, as St. Paul says, we will just be adding to the noise and chaos of the world. And that kind of talk surely led to defensiveness from the men in the synagogue. You know, to be told in so many words, no boys, you're not doing it right. That likely gave rise to accusations toward Jesus that maybe he should look to himself before criticizing others. Physician, heal thyself. And as the conversation grew heated, the calls for his credentials come. You know, who are you to say these things to us? If you are a prophet, then prove it, do a miracle. Give us a sign. And that's when Jesus definitively shuts them up. He points out that, hey, Elijah only saved one widow. 
and you say he's a prophet? Elisha cured only one man of leprosy, a foreigner at that, and yet we all agree he was a prophet. Jesus' reputation, well, it preceded him. He knows why they are there. They've heard of the miracles he's done. And in that, Jesus has compared himself and joined himself in the company of the prophets, such as Elisha and Elijah. He has claimed that mantle of prophet and all the authority that goes with it. I know he's touched a nerve here. He's likely spoken some uncomfortable truths. He's pointed out things like, well, their quite frankly awful attitude towards Gentiles, that is non-Jews, and Samaritans. He's also threatened their sense of what, he might, what we might call their religious security by telling them, no, the law cannot save you. The temple sacrifices cannot buy God's love. He radically reframes the proper relationship between God and humanity, and much of what they have believed and lived, inherited from their ancestors, looked to pass down to their children, is now being called profoundly into question. But instead of using that space and that place, the synagogue, a place of discussion and investigation of difficult questions, instead of that, instead of taking up that challenge and doing the hard work of thinking and praying through what Jesus has said, so as to continue a discussion and come to new understanding, perhaps actual enlightenment, no, they fly into a collective rage and try to kill him. I see a lot of that evil instinct today. The great law of love that St. Paul celebrates with its call to patience and kindness, forbearance and seeking after the truth in which it rejoices, this seems to be suspended. People who say uncomfortable things are to be silenced, deplatformed, censored, and punished. You know, for example, the internet uh, personality Joe Rogan is under attack for the discussions he has on his program. Now, I've watched Rogan from time to time. I can't say I'm a huge fan, but I do appreciate his openness. He's a curious man, and he's willing to suspend judgment and disbelief. He asks questions he elicits information. And I am an able-minded and rational adult, and I should be allowed to know the opinions and thoughts of others, especially as they challenge my thinking and to decide for myself the validity of what I've heard, read, and seen. The Catechism of the Church makes our freedom essential to the working out of our salvation by grace. It warns, quote, the economic, social, political, and cultural conditions that are needed for a just exercise of freedom are too often disregarded or violated. It goes on further that such disregard, the Catechism, it says, quote, involves the strong as well as the weak in the temptation to sin against charity, to violate the law of love. Now, insofar as I'm making a comparison of well, it's an internet person like Joe Rogan or others, to our Lord. It's only engaging what I would hope would be my reaction had I been there on the day in question. I hope that as confused or put off as I might have been, that I would nonetheless continue to have listened, asked questions, discussed, and then contemplated further. Such is what we're called to do as disciples of our Lord. We are to keep our heads when all around us are losing theirs, actively discerning truth, listening in love, and being open to the fact that truth can come from the most unlikely of persons. You know, I studied logic at school, and I recall one of the dictums of the course material was, a true statement is not falsified by the poor reputation of the one who makes it. Yet I confess I might have been dismissive of the carpenter who dared to proclaim the year of the Jubilee. We today are ostensibly civilized. We enjoy a democratic heritage. We have a legacy of law. We've enshrined inviolable rights. We are heirs to a civilization that should have learned lessons from civil wars and wars between nations over religion, ideology, and empire. Now we know that this isn't simply the stress of our current situation that is giving rise to the angst and rage we see. No, we've been through worse, and yet we seemed able then to find our way through all the difficulties 
of reconciling, say, you know, French and English, urban and rural, industry and agriculture, and so on. But now, where is that society? Where are the institutions that are there to facilitate discussion, diffuse tension by allowing difficult conversations and challenging debates? Now, I think people are drawn to folks like Rogan, not because they agree with them, but because they want to hear discourse and discussions without the filter of the legacy media, free of political spin, absent manipulation. Shutting down free discussion and debate denies the sovereignty of the individual and it effectively dissolves community. Now, some of the anger we are seeing, I think actually it's a good sign, provided it resists rage. People want to hear, even as it might challenge their assumptions. They want to listen, even if what is said might upset their understanding of the world. We want love to be at the heart of who we are as a society, without resentment and ever hopeful. That is, for many, an unconscious desire that we disciples know as the desire to be one with Christ. That is something we don't want to throw away toss over a cliff, but to hang on to, because in that is life. In that is love that is the source of life. In that is God.